Welcome back to InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dews, sitting over here in Austin, Texas. Thanks to Paul Joseph Watson for covering the news and all the, the issues important to today. We really appreciate his work out there in England with uh, PrisonPlanet.com and his brother, Steve Watson, tirelessly working and giving us stuff to cover by the time we get in the office in the morning. It's a real pleasure working with those guys. I uh, hope you enjoyed watching those segments of the uh, people who've entered the reporter contest. If you're interested, you can go to infowars.com forward slash reporter dash contest. And you can look at all the details you have till April 30th to get your entry in. We're looking for male, one female, one male winner. I think you each win $5,000. But even if you don't win, people are going to see your reports. We're putting them up on our website. We're linking to them. Lots of other people around the world are seeing them. And we're creating little uh, internet stars out there. So keep up the good work. You guys are doing great. I love seeing the multiple entries, even though it's a bit of a headache to go through every one. I really do appreciate what everybody's doing. Um, I was watching one about a guy who's in, uh, he's having to deal with some cat issues and cat tags. But he's taking them to court, and he's putting it out there so other people can see what he's doing. And, uh, and you know, sharing information, that's what it's all about with the internet. Our guest today, Stuart Rhodes of Oath Keepers. He's the founder of Oath Keepers. I met him a couple years ago up in Massachusetts where they were um, having the, what was this, Concord and uh, Stuart, where were we at then? We were, we were April 19th, 2009 at Lexington Green. Lexington Green. Um, where the first shots were fired in the American Revolution. That's it. Thank you for that, Stuart. Uh, so w we met him and a bunch of other Oath Keepers there. It was a great ceremony that we had on the day of the anniversary of the shot heard around the world. I went over to Concord Bridge, watched the reenactment there. It was pretty interesting stuff, but uh, we had to deal with some local issues there. It was very interesting. But anyway, I turned to my friend, Stuart Rhodes. How are you doing, Stuart? Doing fine. Speaking of April 19th, yesterday was, was April 19th. And oddly enough, or no surprise, um, Obama and the rest of the federal government made no mention whatsoever of a April 19th, 1775, Concord and Lexington, but instead you had officials, in, including uh, Timothy Geithner, um, going and holding official ceremonies to, to commemorate the Holocaust Remembrance Day, which is fine. That's also April 19th. That's the anniversary of the ghetto uprising where the Jews killed some of the Nazi bastards. Mm -hmm. They're trying to murder them, right? Um, but but they you know they'll celebrate that, but they will not say a thing about April 1975, Concord and Lexington. They want to wipe it out of our history. Well, they so don't want to give. Sure we don't do that. They don't want to give real patriots any press. You know that would that would then uh, well, they validate the fights of, 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 of a revolution against your own government. Sure, you know, that's what we were doing back then. They were rebelling against their own government, against the crown. So no government wants to remind the, their citizenry about, about that history. And what were they doing? What were they fighting? They were coming to take their guns. The British troops were coming to take their guns, and the people rose up and said, no, not today. You're not going to do it to us. Exactly. And they were also coming to to black bag and enemy combatant, you know, detain yeah. um, John Adams, and, or I mean Sam Adams, and, and also um, Hancock. Yeah. So they're coming for the for the Patriot leaders. They're going to take them off to a, a uh, you know a Navy ship and 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 take them across the seas to try it in England. So the same kind of nonsense we're facing now with the NDAA. That's what sparked the American Revolution. Same nonsense, different day. I want to go to this article that I sent you and that we covered a few days ago. Um, the facade of federal justice. This is sent to us by one of our listeners up in Montana. And uh, it talks about a, a Butte, Montana city judge, Steve Cambich, who was convicted of bribery in federal court. He receives a $5,000 fine, which was less than the total of his bribes, and five years of probation. And then they, they contrast this with the guy, Chris Lindsay, who's facing 690 years to 25 life, consecutive life sentences, and basically for owning firearms and providing medical marijuana to people. What is going on, Stuart? Well, this is an example of why the justice system should be called the injustice system. I mean, first of all, this is this is a this is a a raid on the medical marijuana providers after Eric Holder promised and Pinky promised that they would not use federal laws to raid medical marijuana providers. And these are medical marijuana providers who were operating under state law, totally legal in Montana. It had been passed by a resolution of the people. A referendum of the people of Montana who wanted medical marijuana, and so they were operating, you know, both with the promise that the feds wouldn't come get them, and under 
under protection, they thought, of state law being completely legal. And yet, the feds came in and raided them, and all the local, unfortunately, all the local uh, police and sheriff's departments complied and participated and assisted in these unconstitutional raids. You know, a direct violation of the idea of state sovereignty and the separation of powers between the federal government and the states. And this is how, this is where we are because of the growth of the Commerce Clause powers through judicial fiat, increasing the power of, of Congress to now they can regulate almost anything, absolutely anything. I can't think of one thing they can't regulate. And so they come in, and even though you pass something in your state that legalizes whatever it might be, gun possession, marijuana possession, whatever, the feds claim that they can go ahead and criminalize it at the federal level and come slap, slap you with charges. And in this case, what they did is they, they, they tacked on all these firearms charges because, hey, guess what? People in Montana have guns, and they have a lot of guns. That's, I can't believe that. Guns. They have yeah. guns in Montana? I know. Outrageous, isn't it? Wow. But once, you, once you're accused of committing a crime, then they say, well, any gun that is on the premises is a gun that's possessed in furtherance of a crime, and they tack on additional sentences. And that's why he's facing 25 consecutive life years um, plus 85 years. You know, he's, he's facing like 380 years in, in, in prison or 25 consecutive life years. It's an absurdity. Mm -hmm. And you can thank the NRA for this kind of nonsense. Exactly. It's always going on about we got to make sure that we enforce all the drug, all the all the gun laws that are in there to to the hilt, and make sure that any any criminal who uses a gun in the crime gets gets punished with minimum sentences. And that's what the NRA has done. So that means as any of you or me. All of us, if we're accused of anything by the feds and we happen to be gun owners, they're going to tack on a whole bunch of additional charges. And what, why do they do this? They're threatening this guy with 25 consecutive life sentences. What do you think he's going to do? Is sure. he going to go to trial or are they going to coerce him into a freaking plea bargain? So they threaten you with these outrageous sentences to get you to go to a plea bargain, and it's all based on your gun possession. So this is an example of how the, the stupidity of conservatives, drug war obsessed conservatives, and law and order obsessed conservatives has they they've put in place this huge hammer that can be used against any of us to coerce us into a confession, to coerce us into a plea bargain. What I think is ridiculous with this conservative mindset is that there if they if this guy takes jail time we're then taking a productive member of society out of the workplace, putting him in this controlled uh, prison environment, this prison industrial complex where we have to feed him, clothe him, give him medical care. And this guy didn't do anything except provide people with medicine. I mean, I really can't understand it. And this, you know, being 420, this is like the smoker's holiday, which is one of the reasons why I pulled this story out, um, you know. And to me, you know, in, our, in my lifetime, I feel... I will have failed if we don't get rid of drug prohibition, especially marijuana. I mean, if, if we can't have people getting access to medicine, people using it recreationally, people growing it for fuel, for clothing, for most of the basic needs can be met with this plant. If we don't have that by the time I'm dead, I'm, I'm going to feel like a complete failure, honestly, because it's a plant and it's a useful plant and we should be using it and growing it. And under our constitution as originally designed by the founders, you would be able to do so, as Montanans did at the state level. Right. The feds have no jurisdiction. They've got no, no authority, no power under the Constitution to regulate anything that's done inside the state. If it's not for interstate commerce, if it's just for your own use inside your own state, they have no jurisdiction over it. But yet they claim jurisdiction over it. Well, this is the problem is that under, under the founders original design for our constitutional republic, the, the federal government has no jurisdiction, has no power whatsoever to even regulate marijuana or any other drug or anything else done inside the state. As Madison said in, in the Federalist Papers, the powers of the new government would be concerned primarily with foreign affairs and, and, and external affairs and commerce, war, foreign policy, things like that, leaving the states to regulate the daily lives of the people. And so we're supposed to be little workshops of liberty in each state laboratories of liberty to, to set our own course. And the people of Montana did that. They passed a resolution um, by the voters, even going around the state legislature, directly from the voters, saying, we want medical marijuana. That's legal in Montana. That should be the end of the story. 
But the federal courts have interpreted the commerce powers to being that Congress can make any law it wants to about anything it wants to. And then you thank the drug warriors for that. You had the race case where a woman was growing marijuana in her own backyard, not for sale, not for interstate commerce, just for her own personal use because she was a separate from cancer. And they ruled because Scalia doesn't like drugs. He sided with the liberals on the court who like federal power. And they ruled the majority decision that Congress can regulate even her growing of a plant in her own backyard, not for sale, because they said that her growing that plant impacts the market of, a, of the legal market for marijuana, the black market for marijuana. It's absolutely absurd. Wow. And so because of the drug warriors, you now have a wide open police power, the power to make laws about anything in Congress. This is what you get. And it directly impacts on gun rights. You have the new Montana gun bill that was passed by the legislature and signed by the governor, signed by Governor Sports or a Democrat. Um, and yet, that's likely to fail in its federal court case because the court will defer back to the race case and say, well, look, if, the, if you can regulate a woman growing a pot plant for her own personal use, not for sale, then surely you can regulate someone manufacturing a firearm in Montana. So that's what's going to happen with that case. So, you know, this is, this is the absurdity of, of, the, of the conservative obsession with the, drug, with the drug war that has led to the destruction of the idea of state sovereignty and the idea of people deciding their own way to live in each state. Yeah, I agree. Uh, the only silver lining I can see to this is right now you have a lot of uh, South American, Central American presidents, former presidents, Vincente Fox just said it, that we need to end the drug war. And it's going to happen. It needs to happen sooner rather than later because we're ruining, you know, we're continuing to ruin lives over this needless ferreting around, uh, digging into people's business and what they want to do with their bodies. So, with well, that. It's something they have in prohibition. I guess what's kind of funny is that's a good example. Is that back in the 20s, they had to pass a constitutional amendment in order to criminalize alcohol in this country. And then they realized their mistake and they repealed it. Right. How quaint. Nowadays, yeah. that's what they should have to do is pass an amendment. You want to give Congress the power to regulate everything under the sun, then sponsor an amendment and get it passed. Otherwise, go stuff it. Exactly. So, you know, so you're right. Eventually, they'll, but eventually, this country will realize that we're making the same exact mistake as during Prohibition. It's growing the cartels. It's feeding these criminal underground gangs. It's only going to get worse, and it's also growing corruption. I totally agree. I mean, you know, I'm, you're not going to find any argument there. Um, moving on, I get, I get a few emails from people uh, want to know an update on the case. Um, I haven't said anything about it since we went to Pittsburgh. I made a little video um, where I went to the spot actually where the incident took place. I shot uh, some iPhone video, and um, there it is up on screen now. It's right in front of the Cathedral of Learning where the uh, Pittsburgh police and other police agencies around the, the country came in for this big party to uh, push around Pitt students after, and this is after they were done running security for the G20. And um, so anyway, Stuart, why don't you give everybody an update on that? Well, what we just is, is that is that they're offering, they're offering $10,000 as their, their way to settle an offer. That's about the best we're going to get as an offer. And, and so, you know, this is AIG on the other side. That's the insurance company, so it's no surprise. Yeah. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's an absurdity, as you call it. What did you call it earlier? You called it... Um, Shoe money. What was that? Shoe fly money, what'd you call oh, it? Oh, yeah, yeah, shoe fly, get out of here. Get out of here. Yeah, Here's exactly. some money, get out of here. Don't stand up for the First Amendment. And that's kind of what, you know, when we were in that meeting, um, you know, that's what I felt like it was the entire time. I felt that it was just, you know, we got to deal with this person because he actually decided to stand up for himself. So let's, let's throw him a little bone, get him out of here, and, uh, you know, we can keep, getting bailout money is tell the sun stop shining. And, uh, you know, I totally agree with what you said. You said, let's fight this. This is a fight worth fighting. And it's, it's a first amendment fight. So, you know, uh, from here, it'll probably be years before this thing is finally done. But, um, I, I think it's a fight worth fighting. These, these cops, you know, totally went out of their way to create a situation that was going to breed people coming out and seeing what was going on. It was totally going to breed people telling the cops to go home, it, you know, and by them being there, I think they created the problem. I don't think it, there was a problem before that. Uh, there was, there was some people holding a demonstration in a park that 
could hold those people. It was only 50 people in the park. They surrounded the park, started threatening them with tear gas. So the people stepped off the park. And then from that point on, you know, you have 30 or 40,000 students in that area, probably even more than that, who all live around that area, start coming out, looking to see what's going on. Cops start beating on their riot shields and they corner a bunch of people. I happen to be in that group. And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a shot that I put online of, of them letting out a reporter before me. She showed them a press pass, they let her through the line. I walked up right after that with my camera, asking them, you know, hey, I'm press too, can I get out of here? And uh, first guy, you know, said, you're with the press and started telling me, you know, I have to leave the area, which I was gonna comply with. And, and then someone else showed up and said, no, he's not with the press, and that was it. And then it was 10 hours in chains, being uh, talked down to, looked down upon, being cold, thrown out in the rain. Um, it was 50 degrees that night. I was only in shorts and a t-shirt because I didn't even have time to change. I was covering events the whole day. I was working my butt off that day. You know, that's what I do for a living is cover events. So we'll see sure. how that goes. But uh, I'm, I'm sure I'm glad I have the head of Oath Keepers on my side for this one. Well, you know, it's, it's going to be up there fight. We're up against a big dragon, you know, AAG, and, and they don't care about anything. But the absurd and disgusting thing is that they get to use bailout money from taxpayers to fund the litigation. Yeah. You know, so they're, they're fighting us with their own money. Exactly. Defending, defending, from, defending themselves from us with our, and we're paying for it. It's, it's totally ridiculous. Defending themselves, defending themselves from the Constitution with, with our own money. Well, <laughs> and I think we're going to have a repeat of this in uh, Chicago. Well, they're already running war games and drills out there now with Black Hawk helicopters flying around the city at low altitudes with guys sticking, you know, sitting out there with machine guns trying to create that presence of, hey, we're in charge here. Get out of the way. We're bringing in world leaders. Don't speak up about it. We're going to have fines. You got to get permits to even stand on the street and say anything. It, it's it's going to be mayhem because I think the people at by this point, you know, Pittsburgh was 09. There's a lot more people who haven't been working, a lot more people who are hungry, and a lot more people who know who the criminals are now. So I think you're going to see you're going to see something going on in Chicago, and it's not going to be nice. What, what's your take on what's going on in Chicago with this NATO summit? Well, why do they need to have a meeting for NATO in downtown Chicago with all these so-called dignitaries? I mean, what, they're, what they're really doing is, is creating a G20 incident. You know, let, let's still close down the downtown area of Chicago, of all places, and let's make sure that we, you know, because of that, we have to have all these heightened security alerts and, and, and searches and cordon and search and, and barricades and, and guys flying around in choppers, hanging from choppers with submachine guns, who are supposed to have nothing to do with this, but, but obviously do. So, you know, they could have had, they could have had the meeting for NATO in the middle of freaking Kansas someplace, you know, someplace, someplace that's not in the middle of a big city. But no, they, they, they want to have a big show, and they want to have a good excuse to come in there and do the exact same thing they did in G20. So yeah, you're right. This is dog training for the American people. It's, we're we're going to cordon off areas. We're going to search your bags. We're going to do what we want because we say it's for security. And, and when we say it's for security, we can do whatever we want. You know, we can TSA and, you. And letting us know that, hey, there are, there are certain world elites that trump us. They're more important than us. They can go in and blockade a whole city, do all of this, and all this nonsense because they're somehow superior to the rest of us. And we better get in line and submit to the searches and submit to their, their, uh, you know, their free speech zones someplace outside of the area where they're going to be, all that kind of nonsense. It's as though each one of those foreign you know, officials were the president of the United States. They treat them with the same kind of, same kind of care and the same kind of uh, deference. Yeah, it's sick. And now we've got in Houston, uh, Sheila Jackson Lee's partnering up with the DHS, and they're going to put... TSA workers in disguises on city buses. I mean, that is just ridiculous beyond a shadow of a doubt. I can't even believe that I'm reading this story in 2012 that we're going to have secret police running around trying to catch people, doing whatever. whatever. I mean, being people. What, people are mad yeah, that the, that the economy is not good? Blatant crime. Yeah, I mean, there's no, uh, there's no crime even being committed other, unless riding on a bus is a crime now. I mean, did that become a crime in Houston? I don't know. But now we have to have police officers on the buses? And they're not even police officers in uniform. They're, they're fake police officers. They don't, they don't take an oath to the Constitution. They carry a, you know, they have a fake badge. They have this fake authority given to them by the federal government and the DHS, Janet uh, Dungbeetle Napolitano. And they're going to be going around looking 
for things to do. They're going to be looking for crimes. This is pre-crime on a whole new level. What's your take on that? Well, yeah, and we're not even talking about um, looking for a situation where they have probable cause that a crime has been committed or particular people or places to be searched. This is direct violation of the Fourth Amendment. This is exactly the kind of fishing expedition and suppression and intimidation that the Fourth Amendment was meant to stop. When the founders had, put, had gone through the warrantless searches of the general, you know, with of assistance, general warrants, so they can just come in and search whatever, whatever they want to. And that's why they wrote the Fourth Amendment. They wanted to stop that kind of stuff, that kind of intimidation and fishing expedition. And yet, here we go. We're, we're experiencing the exact same abuse and violation of our rights that compelled our forefathers to take up arms. Yeah, it's the totalitarian tiptoe, and it's happening every day, every week. They just notch it up a little bit, so maybe some people don't see it, so they don't care. Some people are affected by it, but they're such a small minority that they can't speak out, or they don't speak out, and it just keeps going and going and going. And pretty soon, in 10 years, we're going to look back and go, how the hell did we get here? You know, we're all wearing right. tracker bracelets. Our cars are going to have tracker chips in them. I mean, it's just, it's beyond the pale at this point. Yeah, go to the airport. That's, that's what America is going to be eventually, everywhere. Yeah. And, and eventually we'll have sidewalk checkpoints, random checkpoints on the sidewalk. You have to go through a metal detector and get, get patted down and felt up by some guy with blue gloves on. God. That's what they want. The yeah. long-term goal is to make all of America like an airport. Well, some people are fighting back, yourself included. You've got a site called the intolerableacts.org, and you're helping people write NDAA nullification legislation. Uh, we just pa had a bill passed in Virginia, which is ready to be signed. It's passed the House and Senate. Uh, we had one just passed in our what, – what, how's the one going in uh, Arizona right now? Well, as far as I know, it passed the Arizona um, legislature as well. It's waiting for Jan Brewer, the governor, to sign it, and we're urging her to sign that piece of legislation. Um, I co-authored – a model bill along with Richard Fry, a Patriot Coalition, and it's being considered in Oklahoma, North Carolina, and also in Kansas, and I'm flying out to Kansas on Wednesday to testify um, at a hearing on that bill. And, and people can go to the site intolerableacts.org to find information, and you've got, you've got resolutions written for all types of situations. Tell everybody a little bit about that. Absolutely. We've got resolutions there for your county sheriff's sign. He can just go ahead and, and, and pass his own resolution nullifying NDAA and pledging to defend the people of his county against any such attempt to kidnap them um, with, with unconstitutional military jurisdiction. And it's also, there's also model resolutions there for counties and state legislatures. Mm. Well, that's good. I'm glad people are fighting back. It's, uh, we get a lot of updates from the Tenth Amendment Center. They seem to be taking a a, uh, a lead on this as well in addition to yourself so people are fighting back and that is a good sign i think we're going to beat this stuff we just got to keep shining light on the roaches and just making them scatter because when they're scattering they're not coming after us they're trying to hide hide their tail and run Stuart Rhodes of oathkeepers.org thank you very much and we'll be talking to you in the future good to go thank you it's a great interview with Stuart he's a good friend of mine and uh, check out that site intolerableacts.org and Start talking to your state legislatures. Let's get this thing, this NDAA, these provisions to black bag Americans and take them away without trial, just being accused of a crime. Let's get that stopped and let these people know that they can't just treat us like slaves. And with that, we're going to go to the quote of the day. In honor of 420, we got Willie and Nelson. Uh, I think people need to be educated to the fact that marijuana is not a drug. Marijuana is a herb and a flower. God put it here. If he put it here and he wants it to grow, what gives the government the right to say that God is wrong? It's Willie Nelson, quote on marijuana. Happy 420, everybody. It's the end of our week. We had a lot of news. This was a great week. We put together a lot of stuff, and we're going to keep coming and doing it every day of the week as long as we can. Please consider subscribing to us if you're watching this on YouTube. You go to prisonplanet.tv or infowarsnews.com. You can sign up. It's 15 cents a day. We surely do appreciate all the subscribers who are watching, the ones who tell us even when we're on a little bit late, although tonight we're going to be on, on time, or we went on time. We really do appreciate all your support. We're going to take this thing to the next level. Thank you for working with us. We're working out the kinks. We're making stuff happen. We're building 
really cool graphics and hopefully bringing you the information to empower yourselves out there because that's the most important thing. It's not how flashy it looks. It's are we giving you information to help yourself in your life and escape tyranny when you can. With that, I'm Rob Dew. Thank you very much for watching. It's InfoWars Nightly News.